Good morning and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance podcast. I'm your host, Alex Bonds. Uh, I'm very lucky today to be joined by Alan, who is the CEO of Relativity 6. Um, Alan, good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning, Alex. Good to see you, sir. Yeah, good, good. People that can't see, I'm, I was just complimenting Alan on his uh, cool longboard on his uh, on his wall, uh, which is a great piece of art. Um, it, and that's all it is, by the way. It's just <laughs> art. Um, I'm too old and broken to to be writing that thing, but I can put it on my wall. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it is it something you uh, you wrote as a as a kid? Were you a, were you a longboarder? Not even, not even. No. I just like no. I just like to look cool with it in the background. Uh, <laughs> no, it's I, I can't claim anything about it. But there you're, it you're, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a man after my own heart. I like the art on these <laughs> things though as well. Like I nearly bought a skateboard the other day just to go on my wall, and I was like, yeah, I, I've never skateboarded. I uh, I used to have a really unpopular thing called a snakeboard, which is like two separate plates that move on a pivot on the middle bar. Uh, Whoa, and like, that it sounds became, dangerous it's uh it's it's a bit scary because you're strapped in so um it is i've never snowboarded but in theory it should make me feel a bit more comfortable but um yeah it never went anywhere it was too complicated it's like you know it was like it was really expensive complicated piece of equipment um and you couldn't just get one on, on one and ride but um um but yeah i keep threatening to put these things on my wall um because i need a cool background um i'm a bit too corporate with the, the logo i think so anyway I, I i'm diving into decor we should start there we should definitely start with who, who um who you are who relatively six okay. are so if you'd be kind enough to introduce yourself on the business that'd be great yeah no of course again my name's alan um i'm the ceo and, and co-founder of a company called relativity six i'm sure we'll get into my specific background in a little bit so don't want to bore the audience with that too much but um just like a quick primer on relativity six so i started the company about six years ago started as a as a thesis about um you know could you make lifetime value more accurate with advanced modern machine learning techniques and that evolved into what we're doing today, which is uh, effectively a, a way to classify what a business actually does using uh, what we believe to be pretty differentiated techniques um, in real time. Um, but yeah, so really it's about understanding a company, mapping it to a class code and trying to find any specific keywords or, or an understanding about that company again in real time. So, mm. yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I was going to say, there's a, there's a, there's a man who's just been through the funding round. Um, <laughs> exactly. yeah. Nice and polished. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know. Um, I'm just going through my marketing team on um, on some uh, some stuff, and I, I just said my dream is to get it succinct as uh, the people that come on my podcast, having just done uh, funding <laughs> rounds. Um, right. But we got some way to go. But um, I, I I always want to come back to this first principles. Obviously, we, we've we've got a learned yeah. audience. Most people understand uh, that problem, but uh, particularly for the people that aren't maybe maybe working other areas of the insurance market or insurance type market. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to focus in on like just to sort of qualify that for me that there's a classification sure, sure. problem because I think I think people will be like surprised that this is a necess necessary thing. Like I, I think no, that's totally. I think that deserves going over. No, of course, and and, and truthfully, uh, I was surprised uh, to to understand this problem. It again, like, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but it's not how we started this company. It was a component of what we did. But long story short. Um, even though it sounds really simple to, to say like, you know, this company is a general contractor and this other company is a roofer. Um, it's actually, I challenge any of these, any audience member or you, Alex, to look at five names of companies, addresses, Google them, understand what they do, and then map it to a, like, in our case, it's a six digit NAICS code. Mm -hmm. There's literally over a thousand six digit NAICS codes. So doing this um, is actually quite challenging, definitely at scale. And what we found is most underwriters or carriers get it wrong. Uh, up to 50% of the time, it could be a coin flip. Um, and again, like the reason why that matters is because the risk profile of, you know, a carpenter or a roofer, while they kind of sound similar, because they kind of do the same things are completely different from a, like a risk profile perspective from a pricing perspective. Mm. So getting that right is absolutely crucial. And it's a foundational piece of underwriting and pricing um, in that whole world. And as of today, there's no, in my opinion, um, really great solution to solve for that problem, which is why we've decided to spend all our energy on it. But yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, 
I, I think I love for, uh, digging into those fundamental challenges of the insurance industry, and, and I think that's that's what's fascinating for me is it's like stum stumbling upon it makes it sound le you know less structured, but coming across that real world problem that um, to a certain extent you go surely someone solved this problem already like like surely uh, yeah of course. Surely uh, yeah it sounds so <laughs> obvious right like yeah, it really yeah. does it's a very clear like if you told me years ago like alan this is what you would be solving honestly i just like you know i i think you're absolutely nuts but yeah, yeah. here we are so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Although the nuances are really interesting as well. I'm, 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 I'm going for a new CRM at the moment, trying to classify insure tax, you know, and uh, trying to draw the line between, you know, is someone is is something a parametric or a SaaS or are they both, and 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 are they a digital MGA at the same time, and what, what takes right. priority? Uh, what's the order of those things that they are? Um, right. I should probably pick your brains off air about that. Um, but um, yeah. So to, I, we, we can't talk about your business without talking about the journey you've been on. Um, it's been, you know, we were talking just before we came on air and, and, and we've obviously spoken previously. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating story. Um, and I know we talk about pivots all the time, but like yours is pretty dramatic in terms of, you know, I don't want you to have to relive it again from a gory <laughs> story okay. perspective. Yeah. I, I, I'm pleased that we're a really sp a positive place at the moment, but um, right. yeah, yeah, I mean, it, so let's take us back to the start, you know, what that thesis was and, 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 and sort of where you got to on that journey before, yeah. you know, the, the business sort of reemerged as it is now. No, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll be brief, even though it was about a, like a five, six year uh, journey here. So uh, let's go back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, 2015. Um, mm -hmm. I meet my co-founder, Abraham. So we're both at MIT in grad school. Mm -hmm. We're both nerding out about lifetime value, griping about it. I worked at like a lot of different companies where LTV was hammered in to me constantly and Abraham as well. And frankly, we thought that it was kind of a BS kind of stat. Like, how are you really predicting for LTV? It's, it's pretty static. You know, you're really just looking at predicting number of years that a company is going to be your customer and how much they're going to spend. And there's a little more complexity to it, but honestly, not that much more. So what we nerded out about initially was, hey, could we bring context into this problem? Can we like, what else matters about a company to predict their future value? And so that led us into this journey of like doing all this research. We ended up doing a thesis about it. Um, within the first couple of weeks of doing this thesis, I got major retailers to give me 10, 15, 20 years worth of their transactional data to help solve for that problem which was shocking to me. You know, I had started multiple companies before and never had anyone be so receptive um, when wow. doing that, like customer research. So that was a tell. Um, we ended up building a platform that could ingest internal transaction data and external data and try to make sense of it. One little key piece of that that we thought naively would be important was identifying the industry of the customer and then mapping it to some like macro trends about mm -hmm. that industry because in our minds, we thought that was important. We were very poor um, at the time. So to solve for that problem, we couldn't afford a lot of external data, which isn't like incredibly expensive, but much more expensive than we could afford. So we had to, that was actually interesting and important looking back because that forced us to build what we do now in a really, really unique way where we couldn't buy data. We kind of had to just create it ourselves for, our, mm. and again, it was for our own purposes. So like classification was also like a key piece of it. Um, I'm landing the plane soon here, I, I promise. No, don't worry, um, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have this thing, it's still kind of experimental, it's in school, but like literally before we graduate, we get a massive company in aviation randomly to basically sign up a very like large, like multi-year contract with us to solve for lifetime value type stuff. Happy days, you know, we think we're like amazing. We raise a little bit of angel money off the back of that contract. And then it's years of basically going around the world, selling this platform, going to any industry that would talk to us and selling this thing where you give us your data, we'll blend it with some external data and we'll give you predictions about propensity for each customer to churn, mm -hmm. propensity for them to buy more things and effectively like a sense of how valuable and prioritized each of those customers were. So that that was the pre-COVID Relativity 6 business that yep. we were running. Yeah. And, and, and where did you get to with that? It sounds like, you know, it's a great start and, 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 and clearly kind of had some momentum, but um, were you at any sort of particular size and scale? 
Yeah, I mean, we'd gotten ourselves up to about 25 <coughs> people um, doing about a million dollars in recurring contracts um, and growing like it was it looked good. But there were some core truths there that we didn't really look at that now I can look back and say, hey, wait a minute, that, that didn't feel right. Mm. So one, it was very laborious um, in many different ways. Me having to go physically sell it was a real thing that had to happen. Mm. It wasn't like I could just be on zoom and so it was a bigger enterprise type sale but technically it was really interesting because we had to ingest monthly transactional data from these like massive companies and wow that's really hard like not only is it hard to physically get it but like the key part is it's very dirty data like you know we're talking about years back of data that no one's really been paying attention to Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of hours cleaning the data, right? If it's not, if you don't have good data in, you're not going to get a good output. So mm -hmm. pouring over cleaning and making sure it's organized and looks good before putting it into, into our models was very, very time consuming, very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And to the point where like, you know, you're, you're basically losing more money than you make off of every uh, interaction, even though you can charge a lot of money for it. So it was like, it looked good on its surface. It was growing but there was a lot of expenses. It wasn't scaling in the way mm. that it needed to kind of looking mm. back, but yeah. Mm. Do you, um, so, so COVID hits, um, is that, is COVID, sure does. The, is COVID the tipping point of this, if this story is, is, is that where it, it yeah. sure is. Yeah. So, uh, COVID hits, um, I'll say like literally like a week before COVID I was in Australia signing a very large contract as I had to do like to sign contracts that, you know, everyone kind of made me show up, love Australia. It's one of my favorite countries, but it's quite far from Los Angeles. So like, far. There's, <laughs> right. But like, you know, so I signed this contract in person, everyone's shaking hands. We're happy. And then I get back and then, you know, uh, as COVID hits, they're basically like kind of like ripping up the contract saying, wow. you know, sorry, until, until you can come back, we're not, we're not going to do this. And, um, I won't name names, uh, but it, like the thing is that happens over and over and over again to the point where we were pretty low there, yeah. like kind of by summer of 2020, it, it was looking tough um, mm. for sure. Mm. Yeah. And then it was a game of uh, what do we do next? Like, you mm -hmm. know, what, what do we have and what do we do next? Mm -hmm. So I suppose um, I, I, we talked about this. So there's, there's, there's the pivot point. So, so when when does that come what happens to the business to, to, to get to that point did you presumably did you have to make people redundant or um, let people go uh, yeah what was the journey because it's um yeah i i suppose i'm always interested to when at, at what point that comes because some some people pivot in the course of you know just in in, in better times and, and work's going well right. but that's right. there's there's one thing to do that and there's another thing to sort of go through a pandemic and have contracts ripped up and things like that yep yeah we had um you know thankfully we had a little bit of runway to, to to have a little bit of time to figure it out but like the the process was you know we basically just had to survive like that was kind of step one is like what do we do to survive and, and really what that meant was like it was a whiteboarding session honestly it was like okay here are all the things that we know we're good at here are the things that we think people need it's all hypothesis driven really <clears throat> And then it was a lot of experiments. It was a lot of like to the point where we even tried a Shopify app, like like wow. basically making lifetime value better for e-commerce, which is like a very hard problem to do because <laughs> in e-commerce, it's basically one time purchases only. Like think about how many times do you buy from the same e-commerce store over? You yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. Very yeah. But like so like that's how far we got away from kind of what we were doing and like trying different areas and taking each mini pivot very seriously, like saying mm. like, in a, cause in my mind it had to be like, okay, like, let me go all in on this idea all in on that idea. Like, and we had about five different versions of that. Wow. Um, none of I them said, worked. I, said, but, I was uh, to say that sounds, that, that sounds, ex that sounds exhausting. You know, like that's, I mean, thing. look at me, I'm... Alex. Look at me. <laughs> You're a fine figure of a man. Alan. I would, <laughs> no. that, uh, I'm what's... a broken, I'm broken. Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> But so so when do you hit upon the the right note? When when does the the business as it is today come about? Yeah, so you know it was 
at one point we got really deep with uh, insurance brokers, right? So these, the, the distribution arm mm-hmm. of insurance, um, really deep. We started like si- signing up customers at, at some sort of pace. So like, okay, this is, this makes sense. This is really working. We embedded ourselves within that space. And it was by focusing on that, that we, we had enough conversations and enough exposure to brokers and how they interact with carriers that we had that like aha moment of like, wait a minute, this whole industry is terrible at industry classification. Yep. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm exaggerating to say terrible that, that there's challenges with industry class, which is something that wasn't even in our minds as a possibility. Mm-hmm. And then we had this like, oh, wait a minute, we built we've been thinking about classification from day one, but for our own purposes. Mm -hmm. So then it was like a hypothesis of let's put it all together. We have this thing. We know the insurance industry struggles greatly with this other thing. And by having, cause I'm not from insurance. So I had to have hundreds of conversations to actually understand that this was a problem and how deep of a problem it actually was and that there wasn't a good solution for it. Mm-hmm. But finally, I'd had enough conversations, enough conviction that like, let's put the two things together. We have a thing. The industry has this problem. Let's figure out how to put it together. So like by, let's say, March of last year. So almost around this time last year, we were out there talking about this and starting to get pilots. Yep. So companies were like, OK, cool. That's interesting. Let's see if it works or not, you know, and but like. I'd say like an aha moment was the fact that I got a hundred pilots in um, like a month and a half, maybe two months, a wow. hundred. Like wow. that, that was, so it was like, oh, wow. Like there's, there's a there there. Mm-hmm. So that's step one. Then step two is like, does your thing actually solve the prop, the problem yeah. or not? Yeah, yeah. And we did, we didn't know for a while. Right. Cause you go through the pilot and you submit it and you have to see the result, but it just started, you know, when it's like, simple and good it just makes sense like that kind of thing like it was just Mm. making sense Mm -hmm. our product was really working well like solving the problem that that these brokers broker platforms and carriers most importantly had um and it's like that elusive and this is a very tech kind of like cliche term but the whole like product market fit thing that yeah people talk about it i've i've worked in a lot of different places and done a lot of different things i've never actually experienced it i've pretended to experience it before but (laughs) i have i've certainly claimed it many a time because it's it's easier to claim it it's nice to it's a good narrative to say that you have product market fit Mm -hmm. but this was so different like Mm -hmm. it was repeatable because we had something that was truly like a platform that did it itself it was profitable so it was actually making money unlike my last thing which cost more to do than we could like charge for yeah and most importantly it was kind of like weirdly like super explosive like to Mm. a point where you know our api was just like the usage was like shooting up at a rate where like it would continually break the platform in the beginning and break and break and break and we had infrastructure issues like we had to aws like we need to get on the phone with them constantly and we Mm. needed way more gpus like like all the needs were there because there was such a surge in demand out of like absolutely nowhere Yeah, that it was like, uh, wow, like uh, this is happening. Like yeah. there's a r- real need and we have a real thing that can solve for that need. Mm. What a lovely thing to sort of stumble across. I was just thinking as you were saying that, it's like I, I, I had this kind of rule of thumb for insure techs uh, that we get on that I don't know. You know, like sometimes I've been introduced to some, other times obviously I seek them out and I know what they do. Um, but sometimes we get people approach us and, and my rule of thumb is that if it's not simple enough that you can explain it kind of fairly succinctly, um, I, I'm very sceptical. Uh, to the point, totally. I think it, you know, it doesn't work. And so, it, when you boil a, an idea down, and and then it, it's such a sort of simple solution. If it feels easy, then it's probably. I know it sounds really obvious, but there's something about that. It's like I, I, I think when there's when people explain things in an overly complex way. There was that uh, article, brilliant articles written yesterday. And I'd love to be able to quote the um, the author, but it was in Sifted, and it was basically talking about. Um, uh, basically startups stop getting us to sign NDAs you know the, the whole point was like you know if your idea needs an NDA it's probably because you're kind of worried that 
you know, haven't quite explained it properly. It's not kind of fully totally. baked, baked. And I, and I kind of really resonated with me and I thought it was really interesting. So, you know, when, when you've got that product market fit um, and it's a true product market fit, it, it, it must be just inherently obvious because you're getting a hundred pilots in a month and people are desperate to kind of get this stuff on board. Um, just so people do fully understand that, that aren't aware how does it work? Is it, it's, it's, it's an API? It's, it's, it's as simple as that. Is it a fairly kind of easy process for people to set up? Yeah. So uh, to explain how it works, maybe I'll quickly explain how others do it and mm -hmm. um, do a little point of comparison. So sure, please. Um, if you're a commercial underwriter, um, you this is a data point you absolutely need to be able to price and really understand what's going on with this prospective customer that that you have that's come in that's been that's submitted and you have to check out the quote and see what's going on. Um, there's really a couple ways to solve for it. One, you buy data from a big database provider. Again, not going to name names, but we all know like the very large data providers out there that provide B two B data. Yep. Um, they do. They've done that for a long time. They're monoliths. They're huge. Um, they're very good at certain things, but, um, you know, when it gets down to a mid-sized small business, they're not as good. It's, um, either self-reported data, right? The company is telling the database provider what they do. The database provider will also buy data from credit bureaus, kind of put it all into its package and it's very static. So it's got mm -hmm. a lot of good uses, but it does not solve the problem a lot of the time. So that's kind of like a very general way to solve for it. Mm -hmm. The second way is um, it's people. It's like these very valuable underwriters that have a lot of valuable things that they have to do on a daily basis. A lot of times they're researching, they're Googling, they get a submission, like what I was saying, like they'll check out the name and address and try to figure it out based on their experience, which is great if you have to do five or 10. If you're doing like a hundred, like your brain's going to melt. It's, um, it's not, it, it, I don't, I, I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy to do that on like a, a daily basis. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And then the classic tech company way to solve for it. Like if we had money, like back in those call it like grad school days, the way we would have done it is we would have bought a lot of that data and mm -hmm. trained our models, like with like that big database data to get to um, the answer. And that's how a lot of them do it. A lot of them will also like put five or six data sources in a data lake. Every time they're looking at a company to predict for, they'll ping it against the lake and just look at the databases and see if there's an answer. If yes, cool. If not, no answer back kind of thing. So that's how the world solves for the problem now. The way that we do it is, so it's a little bit different. Step one, we don't buy any data from anybody like at all. We like label by hand and we've done this and could you do it millions of companies? And that's not to create a database, that's to train the models. Right. We'll give, we'll give our machine a thousand versions of what an electrician looks like, like mm -hmm. a thousand websites of an electrician or all these things about electricians and train the machine on that. And we do that with over a thousand different classes and that's not fun. It's just what we found to be like super necessary because good, you know, good data in, good data out. Yeah. Also the opposite case. So if like you don't really roll, if you can't really bank on that data being accurate, it's tough to put it through a model and run mm -hmm. it through. So that's mm -hmm. step one. Step two, again, we're not buying data. We use search engines. So what that means is we'll take the name and address and we'll do about 300, 400 pages worth of search results on Google and Bing and other search engines. We, what we do is we're not scraping. We take basically all the like search engine results which is basically in the form of words, phrases, pages, all of that, that becomes this big corpus of text in real time. So it's all happening in the moment when you like call the API, yep. you get this big, big corpus of text. And then we've run our classification algorithms on top, our natural language algorithms on top. So we're basically getting the data instead of buying it, we're getting it from search engines. So it's true real time. So yeah. that's how it works. It happens in about a second, uh, two seconds at the latest. It's very accurate because instead of looking at one or two or three data sources, we're looking at hundreds that mm -hmm. are cross-referencing each other from the search mm -hmm. engines. And it's this basically living, breathing platform. So it's not like the static database that you're calling that it could be an answer from five years ago. Literally, like the answer can change about what that business does on a daily basis if you run yeah. it. Like, yeah, and that happens a lot, actually.
Yeah, I was I was just actually thinking that even about my own industry. I think if you talked about, I've been in this business for about fifteen years, and and I think if you looked at the websites, um, well, going back fifteen years, that'd be hilarious. But if you, if you looked at the websites <laughs> and and the way that people talk about what they do, the yeah. language the language has changed. The language has changed subtly. Exactly. We, you know, probably it was before it was straightforward recruitment. Then it was like. You know, everyone wants to talk about executive search. Now everyone wants to talk about talent and talent, you know, and and and, uh, and everyone's doing the same thing. Um, what you really want to know is do they do contractors or do they do permanent recruitment? Because that's that's a different kind of payment structure. And that means there are different risks from certain classification perspectives. But um, the real time thing was the thing that I was, was particularly interested in because I was, I was thinking that it's like it can evolve as language evolves with different industries exactly. but also different industries as well and, and and if you're buying data from one of those sort of big data sources then you're inherently buying past data like that's that's what you're buying like and, and it might be very good data it might be very clean it might be very up to date but it's still old data so uh, the real-time element is is really interesting um just taking it back to uh this kind of covid you know, we're trying five different things. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you this. And I, how do you distinguish pivoting from panicking? Um, yeah. You know, like... <laughs> I, it's kind of the me. same. <laughs> yeah, same I mean, it, it, in our case, it was the same thing because it was kind of like, uh, kind of you just got to burn the boats, as they say, and just like we didn't have too much to fall back <laughs> on. And yeah, we were panicking, like, as we did it, luckily, the panic created urgency. And we were, you know, I'm proud of the way we were able to execute. But no, there was panic, you know, what was good was we were, I will say this, because we did a lot of things wrong, we were clinical about shutting ideas down, and yep. going to the next. Yeah. So we were pretty clear, like, if this isn't the one, let's stop, because we have such limited resource and time, we can't stay on one thing too long unless it's a winner um so we were kind of panicking like the panic stopped i, I mean i'm always pan i'm panicked right now i don't know if you can tell but like <laughs> the like pivot panic stopped once not when we got the 100 pilots that was cool validating there's a problem sure but when we started winning them and more importantly signing up contracts like when the money started flowing was when I, and at, at a pace I'd never experienced before in my, you know, my time doing tech stuff mm -hmm. um, is when I was like, okay, at least we know we're rowing in the right direction because we're getting very large institutions that it, where it used to take me two years to get them to sign an NDA, speaking of NDAs, now they're yeah. signing contracts where like in months, mm -hmm. two months, three months, like, wow. yeah, so that was when I, you know, I was like, okay, something's very different here. And I'm not panicked about the decision to continue along this path, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah that's really interesting. Do you think that's, um, I, cause I, I look back on my own journey. Um, this is about my third, fourth, third, third, fourth business or something like that. And, and my, most of them be variations of a theme of recruitment, but I've also had uh, businesses outside of that in, 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 in retail. Um, I always think about the thing that I've learned is, uh, and I've got better at, and it's almost like reps in the gym is, is, is shutting down bad ideas. Yep. Um, uh, my, my willingness to try things has always been there, but definitely in the past, um, it's really hard to let go of a, an idea that's not even like not failing. I had this conversation with a friend on the weekend. He's, he's going with a business and I really back him on it. But I also said, look, you know, he said, what do you think? And I wished him well, but I said, look, don't, be wedded to it like even if it's suboptimal i'm not talking about whether it's a burning success almost the worst thing that can happen is it has some it's not but it's not it's never going to take totally. off yeah like a little like a zombie kind of thing yeah yeah it's yep. like yeah exactly but but that kind of better so do you think that that can only be get through experience um do you think some people just have that or um i don't know is, is it something that you personally have just like learned to get better at do you think yeah, no, I think it, it came over time. It wasn't something, it wasn't a muscle I, I had before. Um, there's like this interesting balance though about, you know, killing a bad idea, but also um, there's like an old adage that, uh, you know, sticks with me a lot. And I don't know if this is good advice or bad advice, but it's, the, it's basically like, don't die. 
Yeah. Like <laughs> if you don't die, it gives you more time to figure out what it is you're supposed to do. But also like don't go, but you also can't go, you know, down the wrong path for too long. But the longer you're not dying, yeah, the long like the better chance you probably have of figuring it out, as long as there's somewhat of a process to learn mm. from a mistake. It, that's the key thing is like you can't just not die and waste everybody's time. And that's no good. No. But if you're actually like hearing a no and then deeply understanding why it's a no and then figuring out, well what do I have that could make that a yes? Or like what other industry would make, would say yes to that, which is what our process, you know, I wasn't, I know it sounds clinic. It's as I talk, I'm, I'm like giving myself all this credit, but it wasn't like that. We were scrambling, Yeah. but it was like, inherently we were like, we know we like, we're, we think we're smart enough to figure something out, mm -hmm. but like, you know, but we have to learn when it was wrong and change quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm. So it's like this weird subtlety of like, you know, don't do something wrong for too long, but also don't die or else you'll never make it. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's funny. One of my favorite things to say to people if, um, yeah, lots of, you know, you have friends and they're sort of intrigued when, if they're working in corporate jobs and they go, oh, I couldn't work for myself or, or, or you're yeah, set up on my own. And, you know, sort of my latest variation of this is having this with a friend. <laughs> and I went, I went, I'm not, um, I wouldn't say I'm brave. I'm just really, I said, I'm really difficult to kill. Um, yeah, exactly. and it's exactly the same principle. And I was like, yeah, you just, I'm just really tough. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm the knight in the, the, uh, what is it called? Um, Monty Python. Uh, I just keep, <laughs> exactly. I just, yeah, I just keep getting up. Uh, and it's felt yeah. like, it's, it's definitely felt that, like, like that the last couple of years. Um, um, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's exactly it. Is that, is that balance of knowing the thing that's really not going to happen, um, and acknowledging that the ability to change. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. Like the, 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 the distinguishing between when you're failing and when you're just not succeeding yet is, is a massively that's, difficult. Well thing. said. Um, exactly. And 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 sometimes that is like that's a lot easier for outsiders to kind of um to say. Um and and that probably probably brings us neatly onto investment. Um and I wanted to kind of talk to you about that. Yeah. Because obviously you guys have gone out and you've raised money previously. Um yep. you'll get you you know, a touch wood, all, all the term sheets are, are with you and, and we're in a good place. Um uh, how do you think pivot stories play out um, in your ability to raise capital? If, if you've kind of started with one business, it hasn't been particularly successful. Does, has that impacted you negatively? Have you come across that? What's been your experience there? I guess in my experience, it's like you can tell the story um, and like you can tell the story well. Yeah. But, you know, and investors, I think, will or won't give you credit, in my opinion, because and, and trust, I have, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. But like, sure. in, in my opinion, you can't tell that pivot story confidently unless you have numbers to back up that pivot. Yeah, right. Sure. Like it's, it's like if I went to investors and said, hey, I have 100 pilots, like give me money. I don't think it would have gone very well. I think mm. I had to say like, Hey, like, you know, I have a hundred pilots. And so, you know, this percentage converted and this is how much money we're making from that. Mm -hmm. Then it give it lends cred credibility to that. Um, and then you get into the good stuff of, Oh, like they learned and they got better and they iterated and all that. Mm -hmm. But to just like kind of anecdotally say like, Hey, like I talked to these like five like customers and they love this new idea. I think I'm going to go with that. Give me some money. Hmm. Uh, you might do it like, you know, it's a, there's a, there's a lot of money out there for sure, but I guess like beyond investors, it's like your own time, I guess I think about, it's like, I don't want to waste my time, like on something hmm. that that's not validated. And hmm. to me, validated means like paying custom, like what I was saying, like beatable, profitable, explosive growth that can, if you don't have that, maybe it's time to die, you know, like, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like, yeah. So like on the VC side, actually, I did get a lot of credit for it genuinely. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's because it wasn't just like, hey, guys, what's up? It was mm. like, hey, here's tons of contracts that I've signed in a very short amount of time doing what I say. Like I did what I said I was going to. And like the other thing is I kept a lot of investors updated as we went. Yeah. Um, so they were pretty like up to date on what was going on. Um, so it wasn't like this huge surprise. So it didn't seem like a huge shift, 
like by the time we got to term sheets and talking about that, it was a, a more way more subtle thing. But if you like make it a little more macro, it, it looks like a very kind of crazy turn. Um, yeah, so, no, I, yeah. no, I see that. Is it like, so you, you've still got, uh, there was no kind of new company formation. It was like, it's the same company. It's, it's yep. yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I suppose as well that there's, there's something in that, that um, if you were, if you're an investor, pot of cash, you, you invest in the team, they, they were running out of money on the original idea. And then there's the kind of like last shot at, well, this is not going to cost a lot of money, but we've got a pivot here. You might get that but going out and raising new money yeah without the numbers that's that's yeah it's it's, it's great but it's interesting that we because we talk about it a lot we talk about uh in fact i did i recorded a podcast earlier today which we we're talking about us versus uk and i and i mm. think in the uk and particularly and, and actually broadly europe it tends to be more of a tendency to sort of go out make money then we can raise some money it's a much more kind of garage band version of startup slash kind of um you know bootstrap culture whereas it kind of money tends to come in a bit earlier i would say as a general rule in 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 the us um mm -hmm. do, do you see that and obviously you're not at that point so i suppose that that's kind of maybe it's an unfair thing to say but i just wanted to get your opinion as someone that's kind of been through that um uh, yeah no you, you, you see it all day, every day where, you know, people raise on a high valuation with not very much traction, but they're going after like a big idea or like a big market. And sometimes that makes a lot of sense because the team is there. And like, in my opinion, yeah, you're kind of investing in people, really, they're the ones who execute. So yeah. that makes sense. But ultimately, I wouldn't want to do that just personally, because like I was saying, yeah. You know, I value my time to the point where, you know, even if you give me all the money in the world, if I'm not executing or doing the right thing, I'm just wasting my time um, sure. more than anything. So I want to validate that I'm not wasting my time. And the way I validate that is by like customer contracts and sure. usage and stuff like that. But sure. I do totally think that um, it's wild. Um, and I've seen tons of deals where it's just like jaw dropping. Like, I can't believe this. Um, and I hope, and genuinely, I hope for the best for everybody because, you know, you know, I've been there as well, um, where I've got something funded way too early and it can be a painful story unless mm. you, you figure it out, but there's no guarantee that you figured it out. Um, mm. even like you can have all the money in the world and still not get product market fit really. Like it, it doesn't, one thing doesn't lead to the other. I don't think there's much like causality around that. Yeah, no, you can't force it. Um, I mean, give away free money if you like, but um, you know. Yeah, but that that'll <laughs> no, like uh, we've all benefited from like the startup, like the VC money that like you get the like cheap deal on stuff like for, yeah. like uh, like delivery app or well, great, but like that it's not sustainable. It just doesn't, you know. Mm. And, and some people figure out how to engineer that into great things and mm -hmm. bless them, uh, you know. I, I'm jealous. That's great. I can't do that, you know. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'm always I'm always jealous and frustrated, right? I always sit there and go. Fundamentally, it doesn't make money, and it, it doesn't make sense. And you know, I, I know valuations have, have got that they're not correlated they haven't been for a very long time and and um but but it is fun it is frustrating because it, it it then becomes you know i i wonder how much is about true investment and because we love to back uh venture back businesses as a kind of cause because they're a creation of wealth they're a creation of jobs uh, most jobs are created from venture back businesses so they're a very good thing like in society like uh, this is a sort of much more yeah. um <laughs> i'm probably going to hang myself here slightly but i'm gonna try not to <laughs> um but i i i think when we get it wrong is when we like when sometimes the industry hugely backs things that are fundamentally always about the next funding round and, and exits yep. and exits of capital. And then it becomes closer to a giant Ponzi scheme. And you're like, going, well, the, the ultimate sucker will be some shareholder will buy it. Um, and, and I think that there's a line between kind of like playing the finance game from a kind of pure 
valuation growth perspective and, and then trying to create brilliant companies. And I think sometimes those things don't coexist in businesses and they can't do. And I think that's where sometimes the problem lies. Um, but that's my uh, left wing <laughs> sensibility, I suppose. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, you know, on, on so, so you, talking about this kind of uh, valuation, valuation um, raise you've been at, at the moment. Um, how was the journey now with all those term sheets signed with this kind of product market fit? Presumably, it was a smooth sailing dream of a process. <laughs> to, to, <laughs> I can't say that with a straight face. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. But what, but no, was it yeah. different experience, different experience this time? Yeah, it was different. It was different. Yeah. It really, it really was like, and you know, um, you got to give, I, I, you know, at the time I was like cursing them under my breath the whole time. But like when I was raising before it was much harder and it makes sense. You know, they were right. Like mm -hmm. the, the business wasn't scalable. Um, you know, the market may have been big, but we hadn't proven out that we could execute against mm -hmm. that. And uh, this time around, it was, it's just honestly, it was night and day. Like, yeah, you know, sure. they, they were, there was a, um, they recognized that we had something genuinely unique, scalable, uh, you know, I'm going to keep patting myself on the back here, but like, my point is like, we had something investable, uh, yeah. this time around and they saw it. So in retrospect, you know, a lot of them were very right, like to not mm. invest in the earlier, uh, stages of the company. Mm. So, you know, it's back to the idea of like, when you really have something that just makes sense and it's kind of simple and it's just kind of working because there's a real problem and you really have a solution for it everything just gets easier, you know, yeah. including fundraising, which is a crazy thing to say, because it's, it's never, in my opinion, or my experience has never been really that easy at all. So no, yeah, I, I think there's two very imperfect processes that are crucial to business is one, the fundraising process appears to be, uh, you know, right. if nothing, but it's just inefficient, and, and, and those sorts of things. And, and that and I'm not saying I have a better solution for it. I'm just saying that it, the feedback appears from from all sides, investors, VC firms, PE firms, and 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 the people looking for it, um, and the rec recruitment process, which I am a large part of. And and right. you know, everyone complains that it's too long winded and interviews are inefficient. And um, yeah, perhaps that's that's the solution I should be trying to solve myself with some technology. Um, I love to I love to sort of uh, always sort of finish things up talking about the future. So um, what's you know we were talking earlier it was like it's a seven month journey from you know <laughs> yeah. like being in the kind of really hardest part of of you know life and career to like in a really amazing position um what does seven months 18 months forward look like what's the kind of scaling process um you know what are the plans to grow yeah no so yeah i mean i think what we have now and what we're thinking about is is basically like a web web and search based way to get information about uh, companies like crucial information about companies so um just so you have a sense of like what we're building based on the technology that we have because right because what we're doing is we're taking name address getting all this data in real time and then running like our our ai on top of it mm -hmm. so there's these other really interesting things that come out of it one um as in the second product we've already launched it's called existence check and the idea with that is like does the entity that you're searching for actually exist online at all anywhere? Um, and we can do that with very high accuracy um, as part of the APIs. And that's really important for, you know, if a company of platforms getting hit by bots or like fake quotes or ghost quotes or anything like that, it immediately stops that problem. Mm -hmm. So that's like something that's been built off the back of like the core tech. The, the second piece that we've built or, or the third piece that we've built, we're calling red flags or flags. And the idea is because we can gather all this text about a company in real time, you can spot out keywords that might be valuable to an underwriter. Like maybe an underwriter needs to know that the restaurant serves alcohol. So we can spot the word alcohol or 24 hour delivery or whatever it is. Or like for cyber, it's really important that they understand these bad words, risky words like um, cannabis, crypto, blah, 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 all these, all, all the word, the creative words we can think of that, that are risky. Um, mm -hmm. So that, again, that's already like built because it's how we've built our system. So I think we're going to keep down the path of 
finding real time information about companies in the way that we do it because it's effective. It's not the only way to do it. I'm not like, I hope the takeaway isn't that I'm discouraging these very large database providers. They have a lot of value, but I think you need both. You need our like real time look at things hmm. and the historical database driven way. And if you snap those two in together, you get a really comprehensive solution. And I think this goes well beyond underwriting. I think, you know, we'll get into segmentation use cases and it's just like a, and it's a ubiquitous problem. Uh, again, it sounded so simple, the carpenter versus the roofer, right? But every country has that same problem. Um, sure. Every underwriter in every country has that same problem. So there's also just opportunities to keep doing what we're doing and expanding globally because it's language based. It's really interesting. It's all natural language. Mm -hmm. type technology that we're focused mm -hmm. on and i'll say like the like natural language has had an insane like two or three years where like there's incredible technology around that that we can leverage to for, for all these like specific use cases but yeah that's the that's what i think the vision is yeah 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 no it's exciting i mean and that's the thing i was thinking you know the, the, the sort of segmentation into product and you know what does a carpenter want from an you know carpenter versus a roofer from an insurance product and there's so much to go at and 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 the more i love i love that actually that statement about you know not it, it's not an either or it's not like you don't have that big data solution and i, and I think i've seen that as in the evolution of guests on the podcast evolution of people that are, are coming into the insure tech sector the insurance is broken thing has been kind of you know that's been a boring marketing tagline for a long time, right? It's like the collaborative aspect of insurance has always been one of the appealing parts to me. I've always kind of found it sort of pretty collaborative and open forum totally. for ideas, you know, and 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 look at the sign up rate and the speed of which people are signing up. And that's kind of tells you everything you need to know. If you if you've got a good idea, you've got a good solution and it's simple to implement, then it seems like people will go for it. But the simplicity is is probably the hardest part of it. Um, and it is the desired part of it. <laughs> it takes a lot exactly. of thinking. It takes a lot of thinking to make things look easy, doesn't it, I think? <laughs> for sure. Um, look, Alan, it's been an absolute pleasure. I always enjoy um, talking to you. Um, uh, you know, I'm really excited to see where the business has gone. And, it, and it's, look, it's a really nice conversation to have about a business pivoting out into a really successful um, place. One thing I've been doing uh, at the tail end of all these podcasts is asking people what's the best place for people to reach out to you. If you guys are hiring at the moment, um, is there a place that people should go and kind of look at that information? Yeah, is there anything they should reach out to you for? No, of course. So uh, if anybody wants to email me personally, it's A-L-A-N at relativity, which is hard to spell, but uh, good luck with that. I'm not going to say it here. Relativity <laughs> six, the the number uh, dot com. Please contact me. You can always go on our website, which is relativity com. And yes, we're, we're absolutely hiring kind of across the board. So if any, anybody's interested in chatting, um, please, please hit me up and, and we will do that. Awesome. Alan, pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks Thank for being you, a guest Alex. on the podcast. All the best. Of course. Take care. Cheers.